I'm really happy to uh, be able to introduce my friend Lou Kramer to you. Uh, before we start, there is one other announcement. Next week, there is a um, the flea market is on Japan and in its place in the 21st century, and um, you know, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in the afternoon. And those of you who are that are interested in Japan or want to see it troll in the world, I would recommend you uh, also put that on your your busy schedules, which I'm sure you have. I have I met uh, Lou Kramer this spring, or this winter, uh, for the first time when we were back with the Washington Seminar. And I was carrying out a project on U.S., Japan, European trade issues, and uh, someone said, well, you've got to meet Lou Kramer. And I did, and he was extremely helpful uh, in getting to meet people and uh, that deal with trade issues in the Commerce Department, but also uh, one of these people introduced me to a number of people in European embassies and European Commission, and uh, I'm extremely uh, appreciative of the kindness that he shows. Uh, and it's important for us uh, as uh, that we make these kinds of contacts and get to know people who uh, help each other out. I think one of the best things the Kennedy Center can do uh, with its students is to create networks, for both while you're here and in the future, uh, people you can see. And uh, Lou is an example of the kind of networks uh, that uh, we who are graduates of BYU can make and ought to make in order to uh, help each other in our progress and to to uh, be able to provide the service that we're all preparing for. Uh, Lou is, uh, Mr. Kramer was one of the first graduates, he was in the initial class of the BYU Law School and along with many of his colleagues have done very well. He served his missionary mission in Germany. Uh, while he was growing up, he lived in Okinawa with his family in the service. He uh, um, serves in a bishopric uh, in the Clean Lord. Uh, and uh, the way he got, he was serving in, in a, working in a law firm in Los Angeles uh, when he felt that he really would like to do some kind of public service. And he applied for and was accepted as a White House fellow. And as luck would have it, uh, he was uh, able to be assigned to the U.S. Trade Office, uh, the U.S. Trade Representative, and to work with uh, uh, both Secretary Brock and Secretary Yider uh, in, in those positions. And then following that, he was appointed to the uh, Department of Commerce. And just uh, this summer, he's been appointed as an Assistant Secretary and is the Director, Acting Director General of the Foreign Commercial Service. Uh, which most people haven't heard of, but which is a very important arm uh, of our foreign policy, particularly our foreign economic policy, which he will tell you a little bit about. This morning he gave a uh, lecture uh, to the law school uh, called Make History, Not Money. Uh, I think he was talking to the wrong crowd, though, and, and this is a crowd that's going to make history and not money. The law school, don't, don't worry about that. Uh, I like my little badge that uh, I got at one of the meetings I was attending not long ago, which I think that Lou would agree with, and it, it, it uh, is entitled Make Make Trade, Not War. Uh, and that is what he's involved with, is making trade and not war uh, in the world. And uh, he will address it today on some of the politics that goes on in international negotiations, as well as introducing us to some of the things that uh, the Foreign and Commercial Service, the, the uh, United States and Foreign Commercial Service does. So I'm happy to present to you uh, a good friend of mine in the BYU, Mr. Luke Kramer. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Lee. That was the most gracious introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. When I was at BYU, the Kennedy Center, uh, or this, the Harold R. Clark Building, was nowhere near as fancy as this. So you're certainly doing something right to merit such a nice environment. Congratulations for what you're doing, and this group, maybe it will make history, and maybe it will make money as well, but in any event, we'll have a good time while we're doing it, and we have the talents in this group, I'm sure, to make a lot of good history take place pretty quickly. Uh, when I hear the word Kennedy Center, the first thing I think is, is of that nice big building on the Potomac, because yeah. I'm spending all my time in Washington, D.C., and uh, I hope to see more of you back there. It seems like every six months when a BYU group comes back, I'd say to, the, to that professor in residence, Send something over to the, to the uh, Commerce Department, the International Trade Administration. Never see a soul. Every six months, I go back and say, send somebody over there. I don't know where they, where they all go, but we could sure use some talented folks at, at the International Trade Administration and the Department of Commerce. We did have one fellow named Albert Bertha. I don't know how many of you know Albert. He was a real asset to what we were doing. He was a returned Japanese missionary. 
came up with some very fine ideas for increasing trade with Japan and then ended up marrying one of the Marriott girls, and I'm sure he'll never think about trade as long as he lives. So, Lou, he's one of our graduate students. He is one of our graduate, that's right, the MBA program, in fact. He's the joint degree program. Joint degree. Albert's a great American, and uh, we need more of those <laughs> back in Washington, D.C. Well, congratulations on what you're doing here. We have uh, a lot more to do in this world, though, and I think this is the group that has to do it. When I look around and uh, see how much most Americans know about the world, it's pretty disappointing. They take studies, they say that 17% of American high school students take a foreign language. In contrast, each Japanese high school graduate is required to have seven years of English. It's tough to compete on those kinds of grounds. I understand that they did a recent survey that 21% of American high school seniors could not locate China on a world map. One out of seven U.S. adults could not locate the United States on a world map. <laughs> uh, give me a break. Uh, there is work to be done. Uh, another study, and this, this is the most unbelievable of all, of Texas uh, uh, college freshmen, it was 20 or 22 percent could not locate, could not identify the country south of the border. You know, uh, whatever it was, uh, <laughs> Finland. Finland. They, they had no idea. So there's work to be done. And I know that, how many here can speak another language besides English? Outstanding. That is absolutely outstanding. Ricky LaPointe, did I see you raising your hand? Yes. How's your Japanese coming? Pretty good. Great. It is good to see that kind of talent, but we need you out there. I am the Director General of the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service, which is, a, as the Secretary of Commerce says, is the best title in the United States government. It's also one of the best jobs. I said that I'm going to, he can just call me Field Marshal. He doesn't have to call me <laughs> Director General. But we have 1,200 Americans and foreign uh, nationals around the world whose sole job in life is to make exports happen, to make commercial activity take place. We're in 127 posts around the world and 68 locations in the United States. It's one of the best kept secrets in Washington. In fact, how many of you have ever heard of the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service? Three, and the others of you are ordering uh, soft drinks, right? <laughs> okay, good. It, that's not as many speak a foreign language. What it is, is in 1980, the government decided the State Department, uh, great folks of the MABE, they needed help because they were not doing a job on making sure that American businessmen and women were able to sell overseas. And so in April 1980, we broke off, we took the stars in our view, we took the, the guys who did the work, and we put them in the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service to help in those posts overseas to make sure that contacts were established with distributors and with agents and with end users with the American government, I mean with foreign governments, so Americans could sell overseas. That wasn't happening under the State Department well enough. And in fact, we've done a mighty good job of it, but we can do a lot better. I'm sure this group, knowledgeable that it is, knows we're suffering from uh, some serious international trade problems. We have the two twin deficits, our federal budget deficit, of course, it's monumental, matched only by our trade deficit of about $171 billion last year. Highest on record, you know, totally unsustainable in the long term. But what we're seeing now is, that Americans are waking up to the fact that they can compete internationally. At the present time, the dollar's level is down to the more realistic level. Trade barriers, by and large, are down around the world. Quality is up, productivity is up, competitiveness is up. American companies now can compete with anybody in the world. And our pitch to them is, the U.S. Foreign Commercial Service can make this happen overseas, working together with the Small Business Administration in the United States, with the State Department, with the Treasury and others. We're trying to get Americans back into the export business, back into selling overseas. But they have to have some cap uh, capabilities to do that. They have to be able to speak a language. They have to be able to figure out where China or Mexico or you know, some of these countries are in the world. They have to make that commitment to go overseas and, and be involved in that kind of culture. And by and large, Americans have been so spoiled by this huge domestic market that we've, been, you know, we've enjoyed for years, we've never had to, to ship overseas. People in Utah think exporting means selling to you know, San Francisco or to <laughs> sending something to Phoenix. It doesn't work that way in today's international market. We have to be able to compete with these uh, third world countries who are in fact competing in our market. And the way that we do that is to get overseas and make things happen. Our pitch to American businesses, and the President feels so strongly about this, is that at the White House on February 24th, he, Secretary Verdi, and myself kicked off a program called Export Now. It makes good business sense. You know, it makes sense to get overseas. The President said at that time, if an American company can't export now, it ain't never going to export. Uh, he didn't exactly use those words, but that was the import. If you can't get overseas now with the dollar where it is, where we can outbid, outprice, outcompete with anybody on price basis in the world, then you're never going to be in that market. 
So you've got to make that commitment to be overseas. You know, 95% of the world lives outside of the United States. The world trading economy is growing three or four times faster than our GNP. We need to be in that economy to be effective. To do that, though, we have to have people who are smart enough to know how to sell overseas, who can speak those other languages and do the things that's required of international business people. And that's why I, I'm honored by the fact that the Kennedy Center is nurturing that kind of culture, the people who will be conversant and, and comfortable in the, in the world environment. We need more of those folks. And I was visiting with Miles, who's a graduate of the SICE, which is a, a dynamite program on the East Coast to ensure that we have the best diplomats in the world. And he was mentioning his introduction, co introductory comments that the Foreign Service exam is in December. To join the Foreign Commercial Service, by and large, you need to take that Foreign, foreign Service exam, which is a tough one. You know, a lot of people take it. But if any group can pass it, it's got to be people from BYU. And we are committed to overseas service. Many of us have had missionary experiences there. You know, we believe what King Benjamin said, that, you know, you're here to serve your fellow men. And to make that happen, though, we have to be committed to, to on a long-term basis. One of our biggest frustrations that I have with American business owners is that they look at the short-term profits, next quarterly reports, what's going to happen you know, in December. The Japanese, on the other hand, are looking years and years ahead. We talked to some people from a uh, no, Mitsui Trading Company. They were talking about a 30-year plan. He said, a 30-year plan? He said, and the man from Mitsui said, well, you've got to realize we've been in business for 400 years. <laughs> you know, 30 years is no big deal. So we, we had that long-term, that long-range commitment, not just now, but for a long-term down the road. When we do our trade missions around the world, it's always astounding to us to see the difference between Americans' focus on immediate payoff and our competitors. I had a friend who picked up his daughter in uh, Ecuador, Ecuador, from a Peace Corps assignment. She was two hours into the interior by train. He flew into Quito to pick her up and had to overnight there at the hotel before taking the train the next morning. He went into the hotel bar and there was these American businessmen sitting around complaining about how tough it was to get into the European, the Ecuadorian market. They said, you know, we try, these guys are tough, you know, heck, my Spanish isn't very good. There's all kinds of excuses. They just weren't selling. Next day, my friend got on the train and went to pick up his uh, daughter. Had a nice reunion with her, and they were getting ready to leave. They went into the, the only bar in town, this little old cantina. It looked like something out of Ernest Hemingway, Hemingway you know, 1940s. Cobwebs, old, you know, wooden uh, counter. He walked in there, and on top of this wooden counter was a brand new, sparkling, electric Japanese cash register. My friend couldn't believe it. So he asked the barkeep, he said, how in the world, you know, two hours from Quito in England, how in the world do you get electricity, let alone a, uh, a cash register like this from Japan? And the guy said, you know, for the last two years, every six weeks, I've had this Japanese salesman come by and tell me he ought to, that I ought to be buying his cash register. Finally, I had to get rid of the guy. I bought the cash register. <laughs> My friend got on the train, went back to Quito, had to overnight there before he flew back to the state. Walked in the same hotel, the same bar, the same American was sitting there and said, boy, it's tough selling in Quito. We can't sell in Ecuador. It's just so hard. I'm sure the Japanese fellow was just laughing up his sleeve because they were out there in the field making things happen. I was in, and had the opportunity to lead a trade mission to New Delhi, India in April. We took 20 American businessmen. At, for us, it was really a good opportunity to break into the telecommunications market, which is just booming in India. We were real pleased. We got 20 Americans there. It, was, it looked like a nice operation. Driving from the airport into the embassy, I asked our minister, how are we doing, uh, by and large, in India trade? And the guy said, you wouldn't believe it. Last week, the Germans flew in 2,000 German businessmen on Lufthansa, subsidized by the German government to the tune of $80 million to push German products. 2,000 German businessmen. 80 million bucks put in by the, the government. That's more than my budget. That is my budget for U.S. Foreign Commercial Service for a year, $80 million. It's, it's a problem. We say that the biggest problem we have is that a Japanese businessman will fly into Jakarta and ask where he can buy a home. And the American is a man flying to Jakarta and asks when the next plane out is. <laughs> you know, with that kind of perspective, it's hard to sell. So that's our push. To make that happen, we're, we are also working on ensuring that our trade agreements and our international obligations do, in fact, reflect the realities of today's marketplace. In the years of devastation after World War II, it was clear that the United States was you know, the, the undamaged nation whose factories could operate at full capacity. And it was easy for us to give a lot of concessions in GATT. Let me just test this group. How many, knows what, how many here know what the acronym GATT stands for? About half. Not bad. It's the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. It's based in Geneva and it's the home of, set up after World War II to ensure that there were fair rules for merchandise trade. But GATT, unfortunately, for many reasons, is now becoming outmoded because much of trade is in the services. You know, how do you 
keep track of an accounting service that you provided, or licensing of, of a motion picture or tourism. Those are all kinds of non-merchandise type trade. GAP, based in Geneva, is really not geared up to handle that. So over the years, there have been a lot of derogations of GAP. GAP is a multilateral arrangement. The United States, to the extent it's had problems with GAP, has, has looked at bilateral agreements. We have the free trade arrangement with Canada. We have the semiconductor arrangement with uh, Japan. We have the free trade arrangement with Israel. Because GATT, to many, to many minds, is not working as efficiently as it should. In fact, GATT, G-A-T-T, -T, sometimes called the gentleman's agreement to talk and talk. <laughs> so we, we're trying to do better with our international trade agreements. But since we gave away so much in the, in the years after World War II, it's a little tougher to get, come up with concessions that will be meaningful to our trading partners. We're now in the midst of the Uruguay, the Uruguay round of new trade negotiations. In fact, in December, we get together in Montreal and kind of have a midterm review to see how well we're doing. And our new negotiations on new rules for services. How, in fact, do you handle banking and insurance and tourism and these things? On intellectual property, how do we really protect this? By the by, um, yesterday, as I was leaving the Senate, just passed unanimous, I think it was unanimous, they were voting when I left, uh, the accession of the United States to the Berne Convention on copyright protection, which will give us another weapon to say to the other companies where they're pirating our goods overseas, we've got to have the entitlement to the copyright protection in your country. It's been a joke. The Philippines, for example, they traditionally have a three-day waiting period to get your uh, things through customs. And if it happens to be a VCR tape that you're trying to get through customs, three days gives them enough time to get a copy just the way they want it out on the street before you can get your legitimate copy that you brought in in your suitcase out there. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of intellectual protections that we're requiring as we enter this new era of trading. In addition to the, mobile, the multilateral agreement, such as GATT, which is the way that all the nations, 88 members roughly, I'm not sure, 80, 90 members of GATT, uh, govern their trade among themselves. We've also spent a lot of time recently working on this free trade arrangement with Canada. And if I had to ask you, which is the largest two-way trading relationship in the world, I'm sure your mind goes to Japan or Germany or the EC, what? The answer, of course, is it's with Canada. The largest two-way trading relationship in the history of the world flows across our border to the north. And this arrangement, which has been voted on and been the result of a lot of blood, sweat, and tears on both sides, is going to go into effect January 1st. And it will provide unparalleled <coughs> opportunities for access to each other's markets. The Canadians are very unhappy about it because many of them are unhappy because they feel that we're threatening their cultural sovereignty by allowing TV stations to beam into Canada, vice versa. Whereas the Americans are traditional trade policy holds that any time you open a larger market to a small market, you're giving away a lot. And that's, in fact, what we've done both with Canada and, and two years ago with Israel. We have a free trade arrangement with them as well. So that's spending, we're doing these bilateral agreements which have caused a lot of consternation among our trading partners because they say, if you're getting a good deal with the Canadians, it's going to come out of our hide. Well, we're concerned about that as well. So we, we are looking at what we do with the Europeans, with Japan, with the, the Four Tigers, and in the uh, Far East and other, other people down the road. In fact, talk has been surfacing and discussions going back and forth about a free trade agreement with uh, Japan. In a way, a free trade agreement with Japan would be really interesting because we, save, uh, we spend so much, they save so much. You know, we consume so much, they consume so little. If we were able to merge our two countries, we'd have it done about right. But uh, that's, that's a long ways on the horizon. Uh, I've spent much of my uh, oh, last year and a half working on the semiconductor agreement that we have with with the Japanese, which sets a floor price on semiconductors and restricts them from dumping in third country markets of semiconductors, which have virtually emasculated our, our memory market for DRAMs in the United States. And that's, that's been a, a tough job, and not much thanks for that. We spend time also working on international trade agreements and the steel quotas, which are due to expire on a rolling basis for the next 18 months, which have given our steel companies breathing room, but have also put prices a lot higher than we otherwise would have wanted them, I guess. That's semi off the record. Uh, they've also, uh, uh, we also spent a lot of time negotiating the, the voluntary restraint agreements with the Japanese on autos, which are about 2.3 million a year. I am continually amazed at, at how willing we are to keep our markets open. If uh, I, I live now on the East Coast and Baltimore is the nearest port, you go down to Baltimore and you see a shipload of, of a tank coming from Japan with 2,000 Toyotas on it, and our customs guys at the port look at the, look at the ship, look at their loading thing and say, 2,000, close enough for me, check it off. <laughs> and they're on the way to the, to the showrooms in about 45 minutes. 
you ship your car to Japan and they, you know, they take that one car onto the dock and open up the headlights and just say, well, let's look at this for a while. You know, and who knows how long that's going to take. So those kinds of uh, reciprocal fairness are required in order to keep that relationship, you know, both strategically and on a trade basis alive. And there is continuing frustration that you may be aware that we recently concluded a beef and citrus agreement with Japan. It's, I think it's been 13, 14, 15 years maybe, no reason to rush into these things. Uh, they've had quotas on their beef and citrus that have driven our farmers, and particularly in the West, up the, up the, up the wall for a long time. Uh, the Japanese, of course, say, well, look, if we open up the beef quotas, the only people are going to benefit are the Australians and the Koreans are going to ship stuff in. And we say, no, the Americans are going to be there to take advantage of it. And then they say, well, how about Kansai Airport, which is a big $14 billion, billion dollar project in Osaka Harbor to build an artificial island and put an airport on it. We spent a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to ensure that the Japanese would allow American companies to bid on contracts for the construction of Kansai. And so far, we've had pretty minimal response by American companies, whereas the Koreans just can't wait to get in there. They're anxious to sell. So when we open a market, we hope that American businesses will come in after us. And that's kind of the frustration we feel that to the extent the markets are open, if the Americans aren't out there competing for it, you know, it's tough to have put all, through all that effort. Another event coming up on the horizon, uh, of course, is this is another audience survey question. How many of you have heard of the unified market in 1992 in, in Europe? That's pretty good. That's, that's real good, in fact. You could get a group of uh, American business CEOs, and, and it would be about a third of that in this group. We did a survey of American CEOs oh, two months ago, and 22% knew that, in fact, something was happening in Europe in 1992. Dr. Farnsworth has just completed a swing through Europe just to see what some of these things mean. Because we're noting that, that the unified market concept that the Europeans are looking forward to, as in 1992, <coughs> excuse me, would, in fact, constitute the largest single market in the world. We're talking 300 million people, about a four, three or four trillion dollar economy. It's the 12 European uh, community countries banding together to have a common, they're even looking at a common currency. That will be the day, but common currency, uh, common standards, approval procedures. They have 300 directives right now out for approval and for discussion among themselves so that if you get an approval in Spain, you can sell it throughout the other 12. Our concern in the United States government is that these walls that presently exist around the 12 European nations, you know, you can't sell your tele communications equipment in Germany, you can't sell your, your beer in France, you can't do these other things. These 12 barriers will become one barrier around a fortress Europe. And that would be a, that would be a very unhappy result both for the United States and for the, the worldwide trading system. Because I am a firm believer in, that, in free trade to the extent that free trade blossoms, you know, freedom grows, and every, you know, the rising tide brings all the ships up. That has been the the case, this president has stood against a lot of pressures to turn protectionist. He has insisted on free trade. The reciprocal side of that, of course, is that we have free trade with our partners. And this president, since September of 1985, has initiated over 30 actions, trade actions, against our partners, whether it's beef and citrus, it's Korean insurance problems. In fact, Korea, it was, it was great. Korea, talk about a trade barrier. They had a law in the books that if you were just caught with an American cigarette in your possession, you'd go to jail. Now, I call that a real trade barrier. That's the kind of problems we, we're trying to fight. In addition, uh, we've, the Brazilians, for example, have this very strong infant industry protection plan. They want to protect their computer industry, so they say, keep your Apples and IBMs to yourself. We say, that's fine, but we're going to put $100 million worth of sanctions on you if you don't quit copying our Macintoshes. And, and that seemed to get their attention, and they've, they've repented quickly. And, there are those kinds of things taking place because the president has now insisted we will be, we will be firm in our obligations with our international trading partners. All of this is preliminary too to the fact that we have signed, the president signed last month, actually now I guess in August, the new Trade Act, the Omnibus Competitiveness and Trade Act of 1988, which really does open up our opportunity to continue negotiating international trade agreements, Euro Grey Round, the free trade arrangement, and other things into the future, as well as giving heightened uh, clarity to our, to our uh, trade remedies that now exist on the books, like Section 301 or Section 201, and other things you may have talked about in your international trade classes. So there's, there's a lot we're trying to do there to make this thing happen better. And uh, 
it, it's, it's certainly not a perfect world. We're looking at Korea, for example. You know, the, the Olympics have been a big hit, but Korea is doing a lot of things with us that they seem to be following the mold of Japan. We have to take the right steps now to head that off. We see also that uh, Taiwan is sitting on one of the largest foreign currency uh, exchanges uh, reserves in the world. This guy's got so much money and they can't spend it overseas by and large. We're trying to work out currency reforms that allow those kinds of things to happen to, uh, overseas for them. There are so many opportunities. That, you know, Japan used to be called the Far East. Well, it's the near west now. I mean, it is close by. And how many here speak Japanese? Boy, hot commodity, you know? <laughs> Keep working on it. It is, we need more. I understand that the finest Japanese speakers outside of the natives, of course, are the return Jap uh, Mormon missionaries who've undergone their mission. We need you out there to make things happen for American companies who are, you know, just are so nervous. They've heard all these rumors about the problems. One of the benefits of the Export Now campaign as I said, kicked off by the president in February was, we're learning about a lot of successes and, and letting ordinary businessmen know about other ways that they can be successful. We have, for example, uh, people selling in Japan that are doing so well, I mean, really, really successful in their niche industries with the dollar where it is vis-a-vis -vis the yen. They've done a dynamite job of their selling. And we've said, gee, we'd love to publicize your successes, let others know how to do it. They said, not a word. Don't tell us so. We, want, we don't want them to know how, how well we're doing in Japan. It's our secret, because everyone thinks it's bad. You know, they believe the 60 Minutes commentaries. So we're doing great over there. Secretary Verity, uh, Commerce Secretary, took a trade mission of 25 American business owners over last month to Japan and got the red carpet treatment. And one of the biggest problems we face in Japan, and those of you who live there know about the cumbersome distribution system where, you know, the 20 or how many layers, depending. Here, you know, you grow up seeing in the book, you know, you. You grow your wheat, and then Quaker Oats processes it and goes to the, it goes to the wholesaler, it goes to the retailer, and then you buy it at Safeway. Well, in Japan, you, know, you go through about 10 times that much before you can buy it. And so our goal on many consumer products is to make that easier for the Japanese to buy it, the Japanese consumer to buy that directly by going to them, whether by mail catalog or uh, by kiosks at the train station, or otherwise getting the word out that there are offers that they can buy things cheaper than they're being forced to do already. We have really pushed the Japanese to the extent possible to encourage them to allow their, their domestic consumption to increase. Instead of being an export-driven economy, we want to let them have that consumer boom continue because they mm -hmm. have lived, by and large, in you know, small homes and have not had the benefits of the consumer uh, revolution that many of the others in the world have enjoyed. And you go to places, we, I was over in Hawaii this summer and I thought I was in Tokyo. There were so many Japanese visitors there. And they're all carting back Panasonic VCRs. Only they bought in the stores there because they can buy them cheaper here than they can over in Tokyo. And give me a break. If we're talking about free and fair trade, that has to allow the Japanese consumer to, to buy the same things Americans can. That's one of the things we're going to continue to work on. We have a, a commitment also on the Europe 92. We get the word out to American businesses. We figure that American businesses, by and large, today generate about this number is astronomical in my mind, but $500 billion worth of sales in the, use, in the EC right now, a year, $500 billion. We're telling American companies they ought to get over to that market now to get their foot into the, into the European market before the 92 time uh, kicks in, because there are so many opportunities that they need to take advantage of now. And I, know, I understand Ambassador Newell is here, was it last week? Yeah. Last week? Uh, Greg and I were in the McLean Ward together, and so it's good to, to keep track of old ward members. But I'm glad he was back. And he was in, in our ward the week before. Uh, he's a big booster of taking advantage in Europe of the opportunities there. Although Sweden is not a member of the EC, it's a member of EFTA. Uh, the other EFTA members, the Nordics and Austria Switzerland, are certainly seeing the opportunities and the, and the threats from the EC92 market openings and taking steps to make it a more unified market. Well, I've talked a lot. I'm sure that there are more things that we could talk about. I, I would like to have the opportunity for some questions. I, I should mention that uh, uh, I, I did mention to Dr. Farnsworth that I would mention something about how trade policy is made in the United States, and I should say two words about that. Uh, first of all, it's difficult. Second of all, uh, it certainly wasn't very high on the radar scope when I went back to Washington. It, you know, so much of life is, is serendipitous. I went back there, and my opportunities as a White House fellow, I had the choice of either working for uh, Cap Weinberg at, at, the, at the Defense Department, and there was a fellow 
there, there was a, a two-star general named Colin Powell that oh. nobody had ever heard about those days, who I would have worked with directly. And we said, uh, he was headed out to Germany, and he'd been a White House fellow himself, and it would have been a nice opportunity, but I said, Colin Powell's going to Frankfurt, we'll never see him again. He's a national <laughs> security advisor now. Uh, the other opportunity was to work at the FBI, but I, I was a lawyer, and I figured, the FBI, you know, I really want to get into international things. Uh, Judge Webster is great, and there's a lot of things you can do with Judge Webster, but you know, it's domestic. The FBI is domestic, and next thing I know, he's you know, the head of the CIA. And my third opportunity was to work uh, with a fellow named Bill Brock, who's a cabinet officer and a U.S. trade representative. And I said, gee, that's international. Things are happening there. I could you know, use some of my overseas living. It might be inter not, you know, there aren't any headlines about international trade, but it looks like we could have some interesting things in, in the future. And Brock said, I'll tell you, the one thing that, you, that may be cooking up is Japan. And this was back in 1984 when the trade deficit was just hardly on the, on the, uh, on the graph. And what a place to be. You know, these, these small decisions really do have long consequences. And so I was able to have the opportunity to do a lot of negotiations with the Japanese and spent time in Tokyo working out many agreements and things. And it has led into the fact that uh, there's a lot more that we can do, not just in Washington, but around the world. And the people, I am continually convinced, the people that do it are the, the, the people from BYU who have had these worldwide experiences, who have a feeling of service and a commitment and a mission and a vision for what this United States can do. I have looked through my list of 1,200 foreign commercial service employees, and the best I can gather, I've got less than a dozen that are BYU. Out of 1,200, and these are people all over the world, I, I am really appalled that it's not more than that. So with those words, we look forward to seeing you in Washington and around the world. Go for it. Enter to learn. Go forth to serve for the United States. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, Dr. Farnsworth reminded me of a quote. Uh, you know, we run through the gate, drive through the gates where it says, enter to learn, go forth to serve. The best place to serve is this world. Brigham Young has said, it is the duty of every Latter-day Saint to gain as much influence as he can in this world and to use that influence for good. To, use, to gain as much influence as he can in this world and use that influence for good. You know, those of us who decide on a career in foreign, in foreign service or public service, you know, have the opportunity to influence people. Um, not to drop names, but uh, <laughs> I was uh, Lee and some others earlier. I had breakfast yesterday with the Secretary of Commerce in his dining room with uh, the, our, the ambassador from Russia, Dubinin, was here, uh, ambassador from Singapore, uh, Tim Foley, who's the Tom Foley, who's the House Majority Leader, uh, Senator Adams, uh, Senator Evans from Washington, four or five others of us just sitting around talking about Pacific Rim trade opportunities. What a great chance to sit down and say, folks, you know, there are things that you need to do for the United States. And one time the secretary was telling me, he said, isn't it really hard to sell exporting to these, to these Americans who haven't, uh, you know, have, don't understand what the vision is of this? And I said, Mr. Secretary, you don't know what hard is until you try and sell Mormonism to a bunch of Germans. He said, okay, <laughs> I wanted to also say, just the benefits, there is life after a mission. I, I served in northern uh, Germany, and one of my wonderful opportunities was to serve in Hanover. And uh, last year I went back as the U.S. government's representative to the uh, Hanover Trade Fair, which is a huge undertaking, 400,000 visitors. You know, it covers 17 acres. It, covered, it has 17 buildings covering, I don't know, 300 acres. And I was picked up at the airport in a limousine and whisked through the customs and put in a helicopter and flew over all this. and you know, First class hotel and all, and I said, gee, uh, Hanover really does look nice from the air. And I didn't realize you know, this had moved. And, this, and they said, how in the world did you ever know what Hanover was like? And I said, well, I was here 20 years ago. And I must tell you, you're treating me a whole heck of a lot better than you did. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great. In fact, I went back to my old landlord's house. And I just said, I want you to know that because you were so good to me, I'm going to be good to the Germans from here on out and from the United States. And she said, oh. Wunderschön, wunderschön. So it was, <laughs> there are some real blessings in being in, the, in public service. Well, should we spend a few minutes? And I, I know you got, some of you got class later. I'm happy to, whenever anyone needs to go, please go, but happy to visit as well. Questions? The, the young lady in the back? Um, I have a question. You mentioned uh, services and trying to get services included in gas. Right. Some of our agricultural subsidies and some of the quotas that we have on textiles. Uh, 
um, what kind of responsibility is, is there in that area, or what kinds of bargaining chips are we willing to, I mean, what are we bargaining with as we push for services to be included in GAP? You've really hit on some good issues. That's a very thoughtful question. Uh, it's you know, administration to a considerable extent feels we've already given up all the bargaining chips we've, get, we've got. First of all, we've got a $170 billion a year trade deficit. Obviously, we've given up $170 billion worth of chips somewhere. Um, but on the services side, we believe that we ought to, the third world countries and the developing countries, India and Brazil, are the chief uh, countries that are digging in their heels on services liberalization. They feel they'll be overwhelmed by the IBMs of the world who can give value-added services on the networks and by the insurance companies of America, et cetera. Uh, and, and Italy and, I'm sorry, India and Brazil are making the biggest trouble on that. And they really don't care too much about the, the textile or the agriculture trade-off. Those two countries don't. However, they believe that they are, in fact, representing their lesser developed uh, other nations who do have a great uh, stake in the textile uh, quotas continuing. I do not believe that there will be a whole lot of trade-offs, agriculture for services vis-a-vis uh, textiles. More of it will be within that sector. We'll trade off services for services somewhere in that sector. We'll trade off textiles for textiles in textiles sector. Although the textiles are governed under the MFA, the multi-fiber arrangement, which is a separate cartel arrangement. So textiles typically don't, don't enter into GATT negotiations, although they're housed in the same building in Geneva. There's a close relationship. But finally, on the agricultural subsidy question, which really is the big dollar item. You know, you think we've got farm policy problems in the United States with 21, 22, 23 billion dollars a year in subsidies. You ought to see what it is in Europe. I mean, they talk about the, the mountain of butter and the lakes of wine and all this because their agricultural policies, their CAP, their Central Agriculture Policy Caps, are so horrendously uh, of a burden that they're never going to get out of that. And it seems to me, this is Lou Kramer speaking, not an administration official, it seems to me, on this point, it seems to me that the Europeans have got to realize they cannot continue that expensive kind of subsidization forever, and they ought to be grateful to trade that chip earlier rather than later. The problem, of course, is the farmers in France are one of the largest political groups in the EC. The, the UK doesn't particularly want to continue the uh, agriculture subsidies, and the Germans, all they care about is getting those Mercedes out of the, off the line. They don't worry as much about the farmers. But the French have got to make that decision that they will, well, in fact, relinquish some of those caps, those uh, subsidies, in order to be the even traders in the world market. Good question. And a tough one. I don't know how it's going to get resolved. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding the free trade agreement, what do you feel will be the impact of uh, Moroni's um, seat for new elections? And do you think there's a possibility of a uh, free trade agreement getting stalled on that? Uh, and Canada, people in the back. Can you hear the question? The question was, will Mulroney, is Mulroney going to be able to stall the free trade arrangement, or what's the effect going to be in Canada if, in fact, we grant the elections? I'm not stating the question very well, but the an let me state the answer, <laughs> which I probably don't do a whole lot better either. Uh, the Canadians feel very sensitive to this free trade arrangement on so many grounds. For us, it's probably you know 50th on our list of priorities. It's front page every day of the Canadian papers, every day. Our negotiator, Peter Murphy, was a media figure in the United in the uh, in Canada, people in the USTR didn't even know who Peter Murphy was. That's how little visibility we got here. That's because we just don't attach as nearly as much importance to it as we should. I believe that it's, when I was a lawyer, we were always taught a good agreement is one that nobody likes. Canadian free trade arrangement is something that nobody likes, but it's enough. overall good for all of us. I believe that Mulroney, who has other political problems rather than, than the FTA, will in fact be benefited by a free trade agreement that passes. I believe it will go forward. I do not think it's the Canadians' best interest to stall. I don't think they will do that. They may try to get some more mileage or leverage by saying, oh, we're not going to do this until then, or you know, try to withhold some tariff schedules being implemented. But by and large, they're going to have to go along with it because it's truly in their best interest. And I'm talking as an American. I, you know, I really see it being the Canadians' interest. They see it, the Canadians see it being in the Americans' interest. So it must be a good agreement. Something in there for everybody to hate. <laughs> yes, sir. Will the ECC make for more professionalization in the different countries, say like Italians making more shoes or just things like that? You know, they, they, you know how hard it is to get Europeans to agree on anything. Um, I think it's going to force a lot of dislocation within, within the EC itself because the, it, one of the biggest problems are going to be the labor, uh, the freedom of labor to travel back and forth. Spain and Portugal have the cheap labor. Will they go to Italy to make the, the shoes, or will the, 
the, the Germans you know, lose it. I don't know how that's going to play out. And I know the, the Europeans are not certainly not comfortable with what kind of results are going to result, uh, come forth from it. I do see, though, that in the high-tech areas, we're seeing more and more mergers in anticipation 1992 taking place. The big Siemens and Philips and uh, Alcatel, Alcatel's in, out of EC, but still European play. I'm sorry, Alcatel is a player, but Ericsson's out of EC. I see more and more combinations of these high-tech players coming into place so that they will be in a, in a position to combat, as they view it, the US and Japanese giants who will have a better entree to fight with them on their own turf. Uh, we're seeing, though, the United States is entering into a lot of strategic alliances, too, to get that foot in the door. We're entering into agreements with Siemens. Siemens is in Florida. Siemens is going to sell $2 billion worth of goods in the United States this year that they're going to produce in the United States. Siemens is a big German monolith. But I think we'll see more and more combinations across lines in the high-tech energy uh, industry in particular. On the smaller you know, shoes and grain and all that, it's tough to, tough to specialize too much. Present. That's how I view it. It's, it's going to be a very interesting three years. And, and our hope is that we will get what we call national treatment from this. An American company will be treated the same as an American company in Europe, will be treated the same as a French company in Europe, as will be treated the same as a Japanese company in Europe. The problem is the EC is saying to us they want to give us reciprocal treatment. If they can't buy a bank in Minneapolis, then they won't let us buy a bank in Frankfurt. And reciprocity is a, a bad road to start down. We really do not want to get into that ballgame. We played that with the Japanese. It's, it's a no win game for either side. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned that the focus right now is that your administration is, is kind of like a free trade part. Do you, do you think it's that our would, administration. Do you think <laughs> that will change with if the uh, Benjamin Dukakis ticket went to President Do you think it will go more into reciprocity? And protectionism? Yeah. yeah. I think they'd be forced to. The Democrats, the Texto bill, for example, last week, I'm sorry. I'm just saying, yeah. A, a strong <laughs> yes or the back. <laughs> the Hatch Act put certain restrictions on what I could say politically. But President Bush will take care of us, let me tell you that much. In the World Trading Group. <clears throat> the problem is of, uh, well, there is a lot of pressure in the, in the Democratic ranks for protectionism. Textiles is a good example. The textile bill has been. It's the most blatantly protectionist bill that we have seen in a long time. We figured it's going to cost 50000 bucks to save each textile job while costing the American consumer $20 billion in new expenses to, have the, you know, the, to buy American textiles instead of overseas textiles. Textiles now, have, the textile industry has had, created new jobs. Their per capita income is, is rising. I mean, they really are in a much more enviable, enviable position than they were two or three years ago when the bill went up. Despite all those things, it was just by the skin of our teeth that last week we protected the, the uh, Senate House passage from, a, from being two-thirds, which could override a, a presidential veto. So textiles is an example of how, I believe, voting along uh, democratic lines, the Democratic administration would make this a much more protectionist country. No question about it. Yes, ma'am. I'm just wondering why, maybe, maybe not an issue anymore, but it was the uh, third world countries and with Japan, and, and uh, especially with Japan, isn't it, I mean, is the cost of labor in the United States no longer a big item that keeps us in, I mean, you didn't say much about that at all. You know, less and less is labor an item. Less and less is that the case. I mean, if the Koreans actually paid the minimum wage we did, then we'd be a little bit more on level playing field with them. With the dollar sinking to the level it has, with the productivity gains in the United States manufacturing concerns have been able to reach, we really do see labor playing less and less a part in uh, what's happening. And it is interesting, to, you know, you've studied econ econ economics <clears throat> and comparative advantage and labor costs and all that. Those traditional rules in so many ways are falling by the wayside. We are seeing, though, for example, India. India turns out more college graduates than any other country in the world. I mean, the, the middle class in India is bigger than the, middle, than the entire island of Japan. You're talking 150 million people in the middle class. Texas Instruments, for example, has opened up a factory in uh, Bangalore, India, for software production. They can get a software programmer there for $3,000 a year. $3,000 a year, you know, ten, a tenth of what we'd have to pay in Texas. But what they do is, it's very labor intensive, so they use that, they beam it in satellite down to Texas, and it works out great for both sides. So to some extent, so labor's- You sort of meet in the middle of the beam there, right? Right, yeah. okay. right. So that, I see, I was wondering why that was not there. <coughs> but things like that are still working. But I see labor paying less and less a role with the dollar where it is now. 
The Japanese are the ones that are worrying now about labor costs. They're the ones that are now sourcing off well, offshore. Well, Green is their neighbors to the Japanese next time. Green, you say? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no comment. But I do know it's, it's, you know, we have, I have spent a lot of my life, professional life, worrying about Japanese trade agreements and hearing about how they're, we can't sell American skis there because Japanese snow is different than American <laughs> snow. And, you know, they, they can't the buy. That's right, and they can't eat American beef because their intestines are different. I mean, these kinds of things, after a while, you start going, give me a break, guys. Either you want to play ball with us in the whole world, or you're just going to say, we're not interested, and then we'll look at plan B. Good question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had a general question about Japan and how to their politics. Um, Takeshita has been the prime minister for a year now, and I was wondering if you, or the government in general, I've been living in Tokyo for the past three and a half years, so I've read the right? Asahi Evening News. Yeah, but I, I was wondering the Americans went. Do the Americans see a difference in trade action just generally from when Nakasone was prime minister and when Takeshita was? Because Takeshita has been, he's been characterized as not as aggressive and not as charismatic as Nakasone. I was wondering if you saw any differences. I think Takeshita has been very effective. He's yeah. been a, on the international, he's gotten more than he's. He has, got, he has done more than he's been given credit for, and clearly with all that dollar cup that they have and the, what they can do with the World Bank and IMF and loaning additional funds, we have to listen to them. Nakasone's relationship with President Reagan was unique in many ways as the Ron Yasu kind of thing and my buddy and all this, and it, it did make it more difficult for us to take strong trade action early. But the President stood up, for example, the Southern Conductor Agreement, we put $300 million worth of sanctions on that. and. Obviously, the Prime Minister Nakasone was very unhappy about that, and the President hung firm on it. And I think that, taking that stance after 40 years of not taking trade actions, was the precipitating event. Takeshita came right, right in after that. That sanction placement last year took a lot of courage by the President. But in fact, it has realigned our agreement so that there's much more you know, talking with each other. The Japanese are treating us as equals, and we're willing to take the hard steps. So a combination. Takeshi did, I think, has done a very fine job for Japan. Um, talented, talented Prime Minister. Yes, sir. I'm curious about the ethnic countries. If it should come together in Europe in 1992, mm -hmm. will see these countries being pulled more into the EEC vortex, or will they be pulled more to the United States? Well, that's an interesting question. The ethnic countries are the European Free Trade Association, which is, I guess, the Nordics, Austria, Switzerland, Iceland, a few others. Uh, they have made overtures to try and get into the EC and have been rebuffed. I see that you know, the geography and cultural difference, all the cultural similarities on this, will require that they, in fact, become a closer member of the EC instead of being a counterweight uh, with, with the United States. I mean, our hope in the United States is that the, the EC92 unified market will bring us all closer together and will give us the opportunities to be more integrated in our society. You know, we worry about Japanese investment, but the Dutch and the Brits and the Germans are investing more than the Japanese are investing. And we have long, long cultural ties and uh, trading ties. But in many ways, our trade now to the, to the Pacific Rim out, out uh, exceeds that of that with Europe. So we have to look both ways. It's, interesting. it's an interesting example of how we're going to play it. I, I was just visiting with a group of high school students out in Waterford before I came up here because my sister-in-law teaches down there. We were talking about how the Japanese were uh, you know, the Europeans have told us informally, listen, guys, this 92 is not going to hurt the United States, but we have to keep out the Asians, which is an interesting perspective because they have always been much firmer in the EC with, for example, the Japanese than we have. Uh, you know, the classic example is the VCR, where the Japanese weren't allowing in some French products, and so the VCRs that came into France, they said, we'll take all the VCRs you can send, but we're going to do it to a little customs office in the middle of France, and the inspector there takes a four hour lunch, and we maybe get two of them through a week. Yeah, it didn't take very long for the Japanese to wake up and say, okay, you know, you send all the Peugeots you want or whatever it is. I mean, that kind of relationship has been fractious for a while with the EC versus the Japanese. And in fact, the, the EC was very concerned about our semiconductor agreement because they saw us entering into an agreement with the Japanese that would redound to their detriment. So the, the dynamics uh, among the triad are very, very touchy. And trade is, is going to be at the core of them. Question back. How about two more questions and we call it a day? How would that be? Sir. Okay. Um, I know there's a problem. A lot of European or a lot of foreign nations in general have a problem with the low dollar. How does that play into? A lot of foreigners have a problem with the low dollar. Yeah, I was just I didn't hear you. Uh, how does the low dollar play with our trade negotiations? 
Well, they have to listen to us a lot more. <laughs> when the dollar got so high, and, and when I was at first at USTR, remember I was in Japan the, the, the day that we had the highest, it was 262 yen, isn't it? About the highest they ever got, something like that. 262 yen to the dollar. And we couldn't sell anything then. Now where it is, uh, at 130, we are price competitive with anybody in the world. And, and no longer can a Japanese or a German or whatever purchaser say, hey, you can't compete with us on price. The problem is, once we got down so we were price competitive, now the Japanese were saying, hey, your quality's not that hot. I mean, there's always, you know, there's always an excuse. It's like, can I borrow your lawnmower? No, it's, you know, it's Nixon's the president. Well, as long as you want to loan lawnmower, any excuse will do, you know? I mean, they're looking for an excuse not to buy. And that's frustrating. So if it's not price and it's not quality, what is it? Well, you know, it's the band around the Japanese heart. We just don't want to buy American. Well, well let's talk about that because we can work with that. But having the dollar where it is now, we're much more, uh, I think, we can go on the offensive and say, if, you, if it's not price, tell us what it is because we want to get this thing worked out. Whether it's in GATT, through the legal processes there, a bilateral agreement or otherwise, we're going to get that trade. We're going to make that export. We're looking, in fact, uh, we talked about an export boom. We're up 30% over last year in exports because of the dollar. And that's translating into about, we, we exported about 254 billion last year. The Germans, a fourth of our size, a fourth of our GMP, exported 311 billion. I mean, seven, what is it, 60 billion more than we did? Incredible. This year we're going to be over three, 320 billion in exports, we hope, if things stay where they are, which is absolutely phenomenal. We, we estimate that for every billion dollars worth of exports, it creates 25,000 US jobs. So if there's $70,000 more exports this year than last, 70 times 25,000 is a lot of new jobs. We see manufactured exports driving the, driving the GM boom right now, GMP boom. So anyway, that's what the dollar is doing for us. We hope that continues. Our problem is we've got Americans, though, who'd rather, you know, we tell them you can make more money shipping from Dallas to Dusseldorf than from Dallas to Denver, because where the prices are. I'm sorry? Sell yeah, they say Dusseldorf. Yeah, I already shipped to California. They say, no, oh, Dusseldorf's in Germany. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that's the kind of thing you're running up against. But there's money to be made. You know, we say try it, you'll like it. We, we say, well, all we're asking you to do is to make more money, to make more profits, go overseas. Well, anyway, how about one more for the road? Yes, sir. Right, uh, how would you, or what would you comment the students in preparing for employment? You already commented on the importance of uh, language studies and so forth. So how do they prepare to get a real job out there? You know, your students yeah, are trying to get question. ready. How do they get ready? Who, who's going to hire them? I mean, what do they have to have to be hireable? Excellent question. Sums up what we're talking about. Make history, not money, but you've got to be able to put the, the bread on the table. Well, uh, two or three things to mention. First of all, the language skills are vital. The overseas experience, which many of us have had, are, are helpful. Those experiences are helpful. I think you have to make a commitment that business is something that's worth going into. I, I, I look at it from the business atmosphere because I'm in the commercial service and I want to push people into the business. But if you're in the legal area or if you're in the academics or whatever, I would really look at the small, medium-sized businesses as, as giving opportunities. Here in Utah, we have got some amazing export stories from small companies who have decided, hey, look, I'm just not going head-to-head -head in Chicago with success. Let me look overseas. I've got to return Japanese guys, my marketing manager. Let's see what's over there. Uh, prepare yourself for that. Um, if you're interested in foreign commercial service, typically it's helpful to have had some business experience elsewhere. We hire, uh, hired in, in Beijing a guy who worked 10 years for Chase Manhattan in, in Beijing. And Japan, our senior commercial officer, started the Goldman Sachs office there 10 years ago. It's good to have some business experience before you go into foreign commercial service, I believe. To get into foreign commercial service, you need to take the foreign service exam in December. You need to do all those things. It's a lengthy process. And frankly, my biggest frustration with government is how long it takes to get good people in the government. I've got guys, stars, that I can offer jobs, but I can't even say you start work for six months or a year. That is embarrassing to me as a United States government representative. But in the business arena, to the extent an MBA is available, that's useful training. To the extent you can get into marketing, I think that's a good way to use your skills. Um, and be persistent. I was, I was a graduate in the charter class at BYU. We had seven companies interview with us the first year. One of them was my father-in-law. Uh, another one was uh, Rex Lee, who was working for the government at the Justice Department. One was Bob Barker, who became a temple president. I think he had to do it to keep his temple recommended. I mean, it was really tough. There were seven guys interviewing. This year, uh, Dean Hickman was saying, I think it was 175 companies. I mean, you we're now in demand. Now's the time to take advantage of our opportunities. And don't be shy. You know, 
you knocked on a heck of a lot of doors as missionaries or whatever, and you learned to take no. That's the name of the game here, too. I had a friend who graduated with an MBA here, couldn't get a job. I mean, he just knocked the doors down. He ended up with a little company called FHP. This is 10 years ago, you know, Time Health Times. That guy is now retired and living off clipping coupons for a long time to come. Because he knocked on doors and wouldn't take no for an answer. You know, nobody's going to hand it to you. It's a matter of getting out there and hustling. Washington's a fun place to be if you want. We, don't, we are in the middle of a budget freeze. This is great. You know, exports need to boom, and whether they do, they cut back the International Trade Administration. We have, I have no authority to hire new people for the foreseeable future. I can replace people, but I can't hire new people. I can replace them from within. We have unpaid internships. Come back to Washington, get some great experience, you know, meet some people. Lee talked about the networking. Washington is a wonderful place for that. I serve in a bishopric with, first, uh, the bishop is Dick Richards, the former chairman of the Republican National Committee, the, you know, the West Coast uh, advisor for Bush campaign. I'm the first counselor. The second counselor is Steve Swift, the U.S. tax court judge. Uh, we, our priest quorum advisor is Harry Reid, the Democratic senator from Nevada. We've got Dick Stallings, the Democratic congressman from Idaho there. We, you know, they do that every election year, you read that thing about political neutrality. We couldn't get anybody in the ward to read it. <laughs> well, they're, all down, they're all down in New Orleans at the convention. We had to have the ward clerk read it. I mean, so that's, those opportunities are back there, and it's fun, and it's exciting. And as, as interns back there, or as young professionals, it is an unrivaled opportunity, I think, to get into that network. I started out in L.A. There's nothing like it anywhere else in the country. There's not in L.A. There's not in this, I don't know what it's like in Salt Lake, but it's not in the Bay Area where I was working either. Washington is a place to serve, you know. You've come here to, well, I preached a little. The question was well taken. Doors, tell me you got something to sell. I mean, if you're going to sell anything, sell yourself first. It's great being here. I'm proud of you all. I look forward to seeing some great exporting as a result of what you're doing. Many thanks. Best of you.